Hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. As part of my 12 days of Vlogmas content, I wanted to put out a couple of year-end wrap-up type videos, year-end roundup type content. So specifically this week in my videos, I'm gonna be talking about the best and worst books that I have read throughout 2023. I wanna end on a high note, so I'm actually going to talk about my favorite reads in my next video that's gonna come out later this week. Today though, I am talking about all of the books that really just disappointed me this year. They were not it. They were not, well, some of them were. I have two major categories of book for this video. There are the books that I finished reading, read all the way through, but was just really disappointed by. And then there are the books that I didn't finish at all. And I actually have more DNFs this year than disappointing reads. Overall, I mean, I did have a really good year in reading. One of my goals for 2023 was to reconnect with what I love about reading, be picking up more books that I was excited about, be invested more in the enjoyment of reading as opposed to the content side of reading and picking up books for content. And so in being conscious in that practice, I was able to find a lot more books that I really enjoyed and <laughs> I had such a hard time narrowing it down to my top 10 for my next video. But it did mean that if I wasn't enjoying enjoying a book, I was more likely to just put it down and not pick it up again. But we'll start with the disappointments. Again, two categories of book for this video, and then my DNFs are also split into two subcategories, but we'll start with the disappointments. The first book that really just disappointed me this year was Dial A for Aunties by Jessie Q. Sutanto, who has actually redeemed herself this year. I did read another one of her books later on in the year, and I really loved it. I think this one just didn't do it for me in terms of the format of the book and what I was expecting and what it turned out to be. This book follows Medi Chan. She's a wedding photographer. She works with her mom and her aunts as part of this family wedding package group. They've got a baker, a singer, Medi's the photographer. They all provide something for weddings and they're about to run the biggest wedding of the year when Medi finds herself accidentally um, unaliving her date. Not to the wedding. She got set up on a date and she accidentally and now her mom and her aunts are trying to help her cover up this accidental unaliving while also running this wedding. And oh, by the way, she's running into her ex, who is the one that got away, who also happens to be the owner of the venue where the wedding is set. I think I really wanted this to be a fun, quirky murder mystery with a romantic aspect, but it turned out to be more of a romance with a murder mystery setting. And that just really kind of threw off the balance, in my opinion. It also didn't help that the romance kind of felt a little bit juvenile and half-baked to me. We were getting flashbacks to the time when Medi was with this love interest of hers when they were together, what led to them breaking up. So I did appreciate getting the backstory and watching them fall in love and then also get this second chance later down the line. But again, it was just kind of simplistic. The conflict wasn't, it didn't seem super high stakes. And so the fact that the book itself focused so much on the romance, which was very low stakes, as opposed to this murder, which was very high stakes, or this murder cover up, which was very high stakes, it just felt really off balance and it really disappointed me. That was like a two or three star read. Next was A Lady's Guide to Fortune Hunting by Sophie Irwin, which again, I really wanted to love and just found so little enjoyment in. This is a historical romance that follows a young woman named Kitty who is left destitute after the death of her parents. In order to save her family, she goes to London and tries to find herself a wealthy husband to save her sisters. She meets a man that she thinks she can kind of swindle into marrying her and take his fortune thereby, but his older brother is very very savvy and he keeps getting in the way, which then of course turns into Kitty and the older brother actually falling in love. It's a hate to love, rivals to lovers thing. But to be honest, I don't feel like there was enough development put into Kitty and Radcliffe actually learning to like each other. There were these big declarations of love at the end and it did not feel earned. Honestly, I was more interested in the side plot with Kitty's sister, which also wound up kind of going nowhere or at least it was set up to go somewhere really cool and then that was kind of nixed at the very end and I was disappointed by that as well. Then there was Black Girls Must Die Exhausted by Jane Allen. Our main character Tabitha is on track to obtain pretty much everything she's ever wanted, achieve all of her dreams by the age of 34 until she gets a medical diagnosis that completely changes those plans and she finds she has to basically get pregnant in the next six months or use the money that she's been setting aside for her dream home 
home to cover in vitro, egg freezing, all that good stuff for kids later down the line. Thematically, this covered a lot of good stuff. The female friendships and the making and breaking of relationships, the harsh realities of being a black woman in America, the medical system and how it does a disservice to women and black women specifically, as well as the fight that women and again, black women specifically have in their careers every single day. But having so many of those themes, it was very much just Tabitha realizing that while she has a lot going on in her life, other people also have a lot going on in their lives. And while she needs to be able to rely on her community for support, she also needs to be someone who can support her community and it's not all about her all the time. To me, that is more of a YA character arc theme lesson. Not really something I expect to see in an adult novel and certainly not something I expect a 34 year old to be learning for the first time in their life. And in a shocking turn of events, the last two books that really disappointed me this year are both spin-offs from series that I absolutely adore. The first was The Stolen Air by Holly Black. This is a spin-off from the uh, Folk of the Air trilogy, the original uh, The Cruel Prince, Wicked King, Queen of Nothing. I love that trilogy. To be fair, I wasn't super hot on it when I first read The Cruel Prince. I came to it as an adult. I think if I had come to it in middle school or high school, it would have been different, but I came to it as an adult and it just felt not my wheelhouse. But as I continued reading, I really fell in love with the characters. And I was really hoping in The Stolen Air that I would get something similar to like the political intrigue and the kind of relationship dynamic that grows between Jude and Cardin. I was really hoping to see that, or at least I was hoping to see something similar between Oak and Ren, who are the main characters of this story, the spinoff, The Stolen Heir. Oak being Jude's younger brother, who is set to become the king of Elfheim, and Ren being Surin, the heir slash queen to the court of Teeth, who has been living in exile for years, who was once betrothed to Oak when they were kids, but the marriage never happened. Like I said, I wanted politics, I wanted intrigue, I wanted court drama, and what I got was a quest story, and that's not really my thing. It was it was a lot of camping. It was a lot it was a lot of going from point A to point B and arguing about the same things but in a non-interesting kind of way. So that was quite disappointing. And then lastly was Nine Liars by Maureen Johnson, which is also a spin-off. This one is a spin-off of the Truly Devious series, which follows Stevie Bell. She's like a super sleuth teenager, teenage detective extraordinaire. She solved a couple of murder mysteries in her lifetime. And in this book, she and her friends go on a week-long study abroad experience to London, which is basically just an excuse for Stevie to visit her boyfriend in London. While they're there, of course, Stevie stumbles upon a decades old murder mystery that she just can't help herself but solve despite her friends and her headmaster's insistence that she stay out of trouble. I gotta tell ya, this, the original trilogy had me in a chokehold when I first read it, but the two spinoffs that I have read just really haven't done it for me. I don't know if I'm just more aware of how YA the characters are. Although I read the original trilogy when I was already in my 20s, so I don't know if that's it. I just feel like Stevie's behavior in this book was so insufferably juvenile. And quite frankly, she was acting like a spoiled brat the whole time. I enjoyed the mystery aspect, but the whole teenage antics and, and characters that I had fell in love with in the original trilogy, I really could not stand just reading about their lives. It felt almost forced, very one note, so that was also very disappointing. I did finish it though, which is more than can be said for this next section of the video, which is my DNFs. Now again, like I mentioned at the beginning, DNFs got split again into two subsections. There's what I'm calling my right book, wrong time DNFs, and then my true DNFs, and these are the books that I am not going to be picking up again at all. The first of these right book, wrong time books was The Witches of Moonshine Manor by Bianca Moraes. Bianca Moraes, this is billed as like the Golden Girls meets Practical Magic, and I was very excited to have both of those things incorporated into a book. This is billed as, imagine if the Golden Girls were a coven of witches who had to defend their manor house from a an angry mob with axes and pitchforks and torches, and all they have is their love for each other and the help of a Gen Z TikTok influencer. That sounds quirky, that sounds fun, right? It wasn't. It's not that it wasn't fun, it was just a lot more lit fic than I think I was prepared for. I was really looking for like a quirky, funky, silly, intergenerational friendship type witchy novel, 
but right off the bat this one was just a lot heavier than I was expecting, a lot more lit thick than I was expecting, and I just wasn't in the headspace to keep reading it. Was very into a lot of the elements that were being incorporated, but I really just wasn't in the headspace to be reading lit thick at the time. I really wanted something quirky and something fun and light and easy. So maybe next time I find myself craving more lit thick type material, I will reach for this book potentially, but until then it's gonna have to sit on my shelf. Next in that category is The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgak Bulgakov. I've had Russians correct my pronunciation, so I'm just doing what they say to do. Mikhail Bulgakov. This is a truly just absurd surrealist novel. It's about what happens when the devil arrives in Moscow with a whole entourage and just wreaks havoc on the city overnight. It's about a lot more than that as well, and that's part of why I ended up putting it down for as long as I have. There was so much going on in this book, and at the time I was reading it there was so much going on in my life that I just couldn't keep up. I've really loved what I've read of it so far, but quite honestly, I did not have the brain power to carry on, so I'm letting it sit for a bit. Might have to reread some parts of it before I can continue, but all in all, it is a very good book. I just haven't been able to finish it yet. And the last of my right book wrong time reads was Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. This is basically Brandon Sanderson's take on what if we gave Buttercup from The Princess Bride something to do. I'm pretty sure he wrote this for his wife, like they were watching The Princess. I've heard this story, I don't know if it's true. They were watching The Princess Bride and his wife made a comment about how Buttercup really is just a damsel in distress. She doesn't have much to do. And he said, okay, well, I'll give her something something to do. And then he wrote Tress of the Emerald Sea and it's beautiful. Unfortunately, I just don't think it's my genre. It's very much an epic fantasy and I don't read a ton of that. I don't read a ton of fantasy in general anymore. So this was just a lot to wrap my head around at a time when I was very busy with work. I think in order to really enjoy this one, I would need to sit with it as a physical book and just dedicate my headspace to that read for like a week, which is something that I have done before but never as an adult. Actually now that I'm saying that I think there is one book on my favorites list that I did that with but I didn't make the conscious decision to do that. This book just kind of consumed my headspace for like two weeks but I'll talk about that in a later video. <laughs> I've also been reading a lot more fantasy manuscript for my writers group. I work with a lot of fantasy writers and so I've been putting a lot of focus and brain power into those reads and when I'm picking up a book that I want to read just for me. It's it's difficult to justify picking up something that I'm already kind of reading something similar but for somebody else and not necessarily just for me. So that extra reading time I really want to be picking up things that I am excited about and while I was really excited about Tress of the Emerald Sea it was just kind of too much for me at the time, so maybe I'll come back to it at a later date. I would like to. I haven't actually read any other Brandon Sanderson, and I would really love to. I've heard such amazing things, but unfortunately this one wasn't gonna be my first Brandon Sanderson. Maybe it will later on, but it wasn't at the time. And lastly we have my three true DNFs, which are books that I picked up and started reading and put down and said I never want to go near that again. I never want to touch it again. First we have The Fine Print by Lauren Asher, which I picked up on the recommendation of TikTok. I was really looking for like steamy romance at the time when I picked this book up. It's a billionaire romance, it's an employer-employee taboo type romance. I thought it was going to be hot. It wasn't. I got probably about 50% of the way into this book. And my only note for my review in my review notes is this is actually so bad the insta love is killing me the everyone is bland but her attitude is laughable and yet I keep reading but where is the smut halfway through the book nothing this really did not do it for me I am so glad to have put this book down and never touched it again tiktok you failed me tiktok failed me with that recommendation tiktok what are you doing? Improve your algorithm. Next was Mystery in Provence by Vivian Conroy. This is the first in a series of like 1930s murder mysteries. The series follows a lady sleuth, Atlanta Ashford, who has inherited this legacy from her grandfather of discreet sleuthing for Europe's elite. So now she's traveling all over Europe and helping her clients in a very quiet, secret way uncover certain mysteries in their lives. I DNF'd this at 
percent because the main character is just insufferably basic. Most of the narrative within her head was just her analyzing certain things about the mystery at hand. We're getting a lot of, oh, my client got upset when her sister showed up to dinner unannounced and then my client complained to me over a cigarette about her sister. Maybe my client and her sister have a strained relationship. And it's like, babe, we are very much not Sherlock Holmes. You do, don't be proud of that. That's basic observational skills. Anyway, I couldn't deal and so I put the book down because it just, it wasn't doing it. I was very disappointed. And last was Love in the Time of Serial Killers, which was probably my biggest disappointment to make the DNFs list. This follows a PhD candidate who studies true crime and serial killers, but from like a pop culture perspective. And she's low key convinced that her new neighbor is in fact a serial killer. At least that's the premise. I started reading this book and had to DNF after two chapters because she's not low key convinced. She is obsessed with proving that her neighbor, who she's only had one single interaction with, is obsessed with proving that he's a serial killer, with absolutely no grounds for that claim, by the way. It is the only thought she has. I couldn't even make it to the plot because the premise was just being so rammed down my throat. It was not good. It was not good. I did not enjoy it. And I knew if I just had to continue reading that kind of obsession for the entire rest of the book, I was going to rip my hair out. But fortunately for me, and fortunately for you, that is the last of my disappointing slash DNFs of 2023. My next video for 12 Days of Vlogmas is gonna be much more upbeat, much happier, much more positive, because I'll be talking about my favorite books of 2023. But thank you guys anyway so much for watching this one. If you've read any of these books, if you have any contradictory thoughts, let me know in the comments. Let's have a debate. I know some of these books are really well loved and that's why I was so excited to read them and hence why they were so disappointing but always open to have a chat and exchange thoughts particularly on the books that I've deemed my right book wrong time if you've got any thoughts on those that might encourage me to pick them up again I would really love to but thank you guys so much for watching don't forget to like this video subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to see when I post new ones and until next time